Hello, and welcome to Wingham United Church and Rev. Collins Reflections. This service is being prepared for October 2nd, 2022. This will be the last time that we'll gather in this space for a few weeks. Uh, we're undertaking a fairly major project here in the sanctuary to repair some, some cracked plaster in the walls and ceiling uh, and give the place a fresh coat of paint, freshen it up a bit. The uh, project is expected to take about five weeks, uh, so we'll be worshiping downstairs until that work is completed. We certainly look forward to coming back into the sanctuary when the work is done. Uh, if you see this in time and you are able to join us, we will be celebrating worldwide communion in our regular services at both Wingham and Bluevale this Sunday. And finally, a commitment has been uh, made to install the necessary wiring and equipment to live stream our worship services from Wingham United. Uh, these pre-recorded videos that I've been making will still be available until we're sure we have the new system up and running and all the kinks worked out, but I look forward to being able to offer you a full worship service from Wingham United Church each week, uh, including things like the choir and congregational singing. Uh, all from the comfort of your home. Uh, of course, that will take place sometime after the other sanctuary work is completed, but hopefully not too long. It would be lovely to have it in place for Christmas Eve. Um, let us now come together for worship. In darkness or in light, God is with us. In joy or in sorrow, God is with us. In our prayers, our praise, our speaking, and our listening, God is with us. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us worship together. And we begin our worship, as always, by lighting the Christ candle as a visible reminder of Christ's unseen presence among us. Let's pray. God, we cannot help but wonder sometimes why bad things happen. Sometimes all we can do is lift our eyes heavenward and cry out, why? Our faith can be shaken. We can despair and question your love for us, yet we know that your love is for all your children and that their suffering brings you no pleasure. In this time we share, may our faith be strengthened so that it will stand firm in the face of whatever life brings. Help us to see the life you have given us through the joy and celebration, but also trial and tribulation. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who also knew what it was like to suffer, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And this week's opening hymn is number 286 from Voices United, If You Will Trust in God to Guide You.
welcome back to Brother Bear's study. I trust that God has guided you here once again. Uh, let, let's begin this part of our service with prayer, as we usually do. Holy God, speak your word to us, and let those who hear guard the good treasure that is entrusted to them with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us all. And the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be guided and inspired by you, O Lord, our strength and our hope. Amen. Well, the first of our scripture readings today comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 19 to 26. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And now we turn to our psalm reading for this week. Psalm number 37, reading the first nine verses. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And finally, we turn to our gospel reading for this week. Uh, we're back in the Gospel of Luke once again, chapter 17, uh, this time reading verses 5 to 10. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, Come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you may eat and drink. Do you think the slave do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Here ends our reading this week's scripture lessons. May God bless our understanding of these words. Increase our faith, the apostles ask. Well, seems like more of a demand, perhaps. But it seems like a re reasonable request. After all, Jesus has been teaching them about the importance of faith, of placing your faith in the eternal rather than the material, of how to live faithfully, of how only the faithful can attain eternal life. It would seem quite natural, then, that the disciples would desire greater faith. In fact, having more faith would seem to be the point of it all. Uh, we see this also in our other readings in Lamentations, written by the prophet Jeremiah during the Babylonian exile. He states that when his mind is focused on his misfortunes, his soul suffers. But when he calls to mind the steadfast love of God and the continually renewing mercies of God's faithfulness, he finds hope and his soul is quieted, even though his circumstances remain the same. He's still in exile. But his faith helps him face the exile in a stronger, healthier, more soulful way. Similarly, our psalm encourages us not to worry about the wicked or be envious of those who seem to prosper by doing evil. They will get their just rewards. We, on the other hand, can delight in the desires of our hearts 
and enjoy peace and contentment if we place our trust in God and continue to do what is right. Again, having faith and acting faithfully are the keys to peace and contentment, even in the face of struggle, hardship, and injustice. Knowing this, don't we all want to cry out to Christ, Increase my faith! <laughs> but when the disciples make their request, Jesus seems to criticize their lack of faith. If they had even the slightest, tiniest tidbit of faith, like one of these tiny little wee mustard seeds, they could perform miracles, but they lack even that small morsel. Then he goes on what feels like a little bit of a rant. Uh, as he so often does when he's trying to make a point, he tells them a parable, this time of a master and slave, apparently illustrating for them that although they have perhaps done all that has been asked of them, they have still not earned or are not worthy of the gift for which they yearn. And if they who have left jobs and homes and families to follow Jesus don't have even this tiny amount of faith, what of us? If they are not worthy of an increase of faith, who is? Now I consider myself to be a man of faith. I certainly would not be doing what I am doing right now if I did not have faith. In fact, I couldn't do what I do without faith. And yet I cannot transplant a tree simply by telling it to move. I must dig and plant and water and nurture. So it would seem my faith is also much tinier than the mustard seed Jesus refers to. I know too that you people also have faith, or you would not be spending your time sitting here listening to me, listening to our songs of praise, offering prayers together. You are faithful people. Faith has carried you through some very difficult times in your lives, just like the prophet laments. And yet Jesus suggests that your faith is practically microscopic. <laughs> but what if Jesus' reference to the size of a disciple's faith is relative? Perhaps Jesus is saying that their faith is minuscule compared to the greatness and power of his own. What exactly are the disciples really asking for here? Is it enough faith to continue to follow Jesus as they've already been doing? It would seem that they already possess that much faith. Perhaps it's just a little more to help them through the rough patches. Or are they asking for a faith like Christ's, a faith that's manifested in the power to perform miracles? Do they desire a faith so strong that it makes everything Jesus is asking them to do and endure effortless or even avoidable? Are they asking to be made equal to Christ himself? That is an, an entirely different request. That is a request not for faith, but for power. That desire for equality with God is what got Adam and Eve in trouble in the Garden of Eden. If Adam, or Peter and John, had gained that kind of power by faith, would any of them have had the wisdom to use it well? Would any one of us? Remember the, the scene from Disney's Fantasia, when Mickey Mouse, the sorcerer's apprentice, gets tired of doing the hard work of doing his chores and decides to use a little magic to make the job go easier. In fact, to remove all of his own toil and difficulty. It starts out fine with the brooms and mops and buckets moving on their own, dancing around the, um, the, the, the workspace, uh, doing the work that Mickey was supposed to do. But soon the magic becomes too strong for Mickey and he loses control and the scene becomes a disaster. With that kind of power at our disposal, how many of us could resist abusing it? People often joke with me about praying for good weather for, for certain events. But imagine if my faith were strong enough to actually control the weather. When I prayed for warm, sunny weather, not too hot or humid, just comfortable for sitting out on the deck and reading a book on my day off. A farmer just a few miles away 
might at that very same moment be praying for rain to make his crops grow? Whose prayers would be answered? Those of the person who had the greater faith? Or those whose requests aligned with the will of God? Can you imagine the chaos that would result if everyone who believed in Christ had faith powerful enough to do the things that Christ could do? Why, we'd have mulberry trees holding up traffic as they moved from place to place. If we had faith strong enough, big enough to face life's adversities without pain or hardship, would we not likely have faith enough to avoid those adversities in the first place? And if we did, would we have the wisdom to ensure that our ease and pleasure did not come at the expense of someone else? I can only speculate on how things might have changed in my life if I'd had the power to alter certain events. I have no way of knowing how those changes might have affected the lives of others, or how things that I may have avoided have contributed to my growth and development. While I might desire Christ's faith, it would be dangerous to possess it without also having Christ's vision of the past, present, and future, or his wisdom. So Jesus tells his disciples that the gift they ask for is not for them. Their task is to do what their master tells them to do, and the faith they have, however small, is sufficient for that task. True faith lies in serving and trusting, even when things don't go the way we want, even when life is challenging and painful, and when the things Christ commands us to do are difficult. When it seems that our faith is too weak for what lies before us, then we must rely on the faith of Christ and of those around us to carry us through. I think that the apostles were asking for Christ to increase their faith in themselves, which would lead them to depend less on him. And that could be very dangerous indeed. I imagine we've all heard the saying, God will never give you more than you can handle. I've said it myself in the past, but I don't say that anymore. I believe that life frequently gives us far more than we can handle on our own. It's at those times I most need my faith. Not in my ability to handle things alone, but in Christ's ability to carry the part of the burden that is beyond my own strength and ability. So when life's struggles get me down, when I'm feeling overwhelmed by the to-do list that never seems to get done, when I'm not sure I can handle one more phone call at the end of the day, or when life just doesn't seem fair, and I can feel my resentment and bitterness and sense of despair and blood pressure increase, I don't need to ask Christ to increase my faith. I need only stop, take a moment to remember God's love and grace, take a deep breath and sigh, and ask the Spirit not for more faith, but for the patience, fortitude, and determination I need to get me through another day. The faith I have is already sufficient. Let's pray. Holy, loving God, as leaves begin to change color and days get shorter and our fall harvest time continues, we enter our season of thanksgiving. For your grace and love in spite of all our failings, we give you thanks for our daily bread in a world where so many live with hunger, we give you thanks. For all the many blessings we have received from your almighty hand, we give you thanks. As we acknowledge our blessings, we also pray for those who can only dream of things many of us take for granted. For people who yearn for love and friendship, who suffer for lack of food and safe, secure sources of water, who needlessly die of illness that is avoidable or curable. We pray for the basic necessities of life. For your children who live in fear of war or violence, who suffer under oppression often from the governments who exist to protect them, who've been left homeless or distressed due to natural disaster 
And of course, we think especially of people in Atlantic Canada struggling to recover from the devastation of Hurricane Fiona, and those in the Caribbean and the United States also suffering from the increased ferocity of our fall storm season. We pray for peace, security, and restoration. For our neighbors around the world who suffer and struggle in ways we cannot even imagine, we pray for justice. Abiding Spirit, we pray for people in our community, our church, and our families, those who lost their jobs or struggle to find adequate, meaningful employment, those who live with addiction, those fighting or recovering from illness or injury of body, mind, or spirit, those who live in fear and uncertainty, whatever the cause, and those who live in homes or relationships torn apart by conflict, we pray for strength, comfort, and healing. God of the molecules, who exists in all of creation, we pray for ourselves. Every person gathered here today has concerns and fears for themselves or loved ones that color their lives and trouble their hearts. Hear us now, O Lord, as each person names those personal prayers they most need to share with you today. We bring these prayers before you, knowing that you listen, trusting in your wisdom, secure in your love, and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our closing hymn today is number 288, um, recalling the words of one of our scripture readings today, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 288.
to repeat the words of Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. The steadfast love of God never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore have hope as you bring your gifts to God. For the tithes and offerings we have received in support of our ministries, including this video worship ministry, let us pray. Holy God, your faithfulness endures forever and your mercies never end. As we offer these gifts, we pray that you will guide us in their stewardship so that our faith will be passed down to the future generations and your compassion may be made known to all. Amen. Well, I leave you once again with the words of the great commandment. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Seek to be a blessing to all you meet. Brighten someone's day every chance you get. And take time to enjoy the beauty of God's creation, especially in this fall season as the fall colors uh, make their appearance. In these you will find the peace and the presence of God. And so now we extinguish our Christ candle to mark the end of this service. But of course, we carry the light of Christ in our hearts wherever we go. And so may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the light of Christ in you. And may the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit lead and inspire you throughout the days ahead. Amen.